For me, it's it's after medical school. So after the four years of medical school, that's five total years. So you do an internship. Uh, it's a one year internship, just like a radiologist, dermatology, anesthesiology. Um, so it's an internal medicine one year internship. Dr. Christopher Saylor. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. How are you, Dr. Gray? I am doing great. Uh, I'm excited to, to chat with you um, about uh, some psychiatry. I mean, uh, physiatry what? today. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, how many times have people go, what, psychiatry? Physi like, when you look at the word, it's very similar. Right. Yeah. Or if you're trying to, you know, if you look at it, it looks similar, or if somebody says it quickly, yeah. you, you also will do a double take. Yeah. <laughs> how, how many times do patients come in, lie down on the exam table and go, Okay, Doc, I really need to tell you what's going yeah. on in my life. Man, man, when I was six, you know, like, you know, <laughs> um, oh. yeah, they, they generally get a, you know, a pretty quick idea because something hurts on their body. Yeah. So they usually know that they're not there to just talk about it, that we got to yeah. do something about it. So it's like the um, the urologist and neurologist joke. You get the, the older people pulling down their pants and they're all just like, no, wrong, <laughs> wrong profession. No, 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 no. Yeah. Yes. Can't do that. Yeah. Can't do that. Nope. All right. So our favorite question here uh, for eShadowing is what is bread and butter for physical medicine and rehabilitation, also known as physiatry? So what I do, bread and butter, is non-surgical orthopedic, basically. Um, you know, so a lot of just primary care musculoskeletal medicine. Many of us then start to subspecialize and kind of get further into the weeds one way or another. But I think general musculoskeletal medicine is the bread and butter. Musculoskeletal medicine. So what what is that? For for the pre-med student or maybe medical yeah. student uh, looking at this, what, what does that actually yeah. mean? So does a body part hurt or does it not work? You know, so anything to deal with bones, joints, muscles, tendons, nerves, those organ systems is really what we're focused on. Uh, again, sometimes related to pain, uh, but also especially with physiatry related to the function. Uh, so you may have somebody who has knee arthritis and it hurts, or you may have grandma that has some imbalance as she's walking and she's at a fall risk. So how she's interacting with her environment, uh, we relate, you know, we can treat her, we may do some workup or things like that. So, you know, that's really what musculoskeletal means. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so, so Nora asks, are we live or is it recorded? We are definitely live, Nora. Welcome. Welcome. Very, very much live. <laughs> um, uh, a good question from Amy uh, that someone else has as well is what's the difference between physical medicine rehabilitation and physical therapy? What, what is that difference? So very different. There's a lot of overlap uh, with patients you may see, but um, as a physiatrist, I'm a so a medical doctor, you know, go through four years of medical school, you have your internship, do residency, and I did additional fellowship in sports medicine. So you're really coming to me for the basically the, the quarterback, the management, you may come in and you don't know what's going on. So just like if you have a knee problem, and you go see orthopedics, you may see me. If you have a nerve problem, you say may see me or neurology you got to come up with the right diagnosis. So seeing a patient, getting the diagnosis and coming up with the treatment plan, that treatment plan may include physical therapy. So I may need them to work with the therapist to gain strength or mobility in a specific area. Um, may also need to prescribe medicines, do injections, do other diagnostic testing as, as well. Um, but I'll tell you know a patient, for example, use the knee arthritis example that, okay, we'll do an injection, but we also need you to get stronger and work on some things to get the knee stronger. So I'll refer them to physical therapy and they'll work with a physical therapist often a few times a week for a few weeks. And the physical therapist is there to um, kind of assess them physically and start to try to come up with a program specific for them. So they're really working on the exercise standpoint the, from stretching, strengthening. They also have a lot of other techniques and modalities, you know, treat them. So they may help with massage or heat or other things to help, but it's a lot of hands-on treatment from the physical therapy uh, standpoint. Um, but certainly as a doctor, 
a lot of what we do is from the diagnostic standpoint. And then we also do other interventions as well. Yeah. You mentioned internship, fellowship. What is what does the training path look like? How long does it take to to become you? For me, it's it's after medical school. So after the four years of medical school, that's five total years. So you do an internship. Uh, it's a one year internship, just like a radiologist, dermatology, anesthesiology. Um, so it's an internal medicine one year internship. Then you do a three years residency, uh, and then I also did a fellowship in you know board certified also in sports medicine um, as as well. So that's one additional year. So it's five years after medical school. Long. Long, long time. <laughs> long could, time. Could be longer, but could be, could yeah. be. Um, <laughs> you could be a neurosurgeon. <laughs> could be, yeah. Um, that ne- never ends. Um, for the the student out here listening and watching, they are scared of the OR, maybe, uh, but they okay. love the type of, of stuff that an orthopod does. And you you mentioned non surgical orthopedics. Mm-hmm. So does that sound like a good career? for for someone who likes that type of patient but is kind yeah. of intimidated by the operating room? Absolutely, yeah. And and again, there may be many reasons to choose physiatry over ortho or vice versa. From my standpoint as a non-surgeon, one of the biggest determining factors was not am I scared of the OR because the OR, I mean, I thought it was fun. For me, if you're going to be a surgeon, you have to love the OR. I think that's a non-starter. Yeah. So if you reflect in on yourself and you're doing rotations and you're not just loving every minute that you're in there as a student, the surgery is probably not right for you. You want to spend time in the OR and just know that that's where you want to be. Um, and I thought it was fun, but I didn't have a passion for the OR and that kind of helped me to make that decision. So that's how I looked at it. Yeah. Amy asks, do you do any procedures? <laughs> I'll maybe follow up with, do you not do any procedures? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess specific with me outside of, um, you know, just seeing patients in the in the office, you know, doing normal history, physical, um, doing x-ray, you know, having a patient do x-ray, interpreting the x-rays or MRIs, which is all kind of standard things. I guess specific for me, uh, I do some diagnostic testing. So I do EMG tests. So an EMG is a nerve conduction study or electromyography. And basically that's a test evaluating the functionality of nerves. So if somebody has some type of neurologic disorder or neurologic dysfunction, you may do that test to better get a handle. Uh, some things people commonly have heard of is carpal tunnel syndrome. That's a nerve compression in the wrist. Um, so if somebody has numbness or tingling uh, in the hands and fingers, you don't want to do that test to confirm the diagnosis or assess. So I do that evaluation to better diagnose that. Um, I do other procedures, a lot to do with injections. So again, that kind of uh, fills the gap of other non-surgical procedures. For me, it's not just normal injections where, all right, you have a knee problem and boom, you plop it in the knee. Um, I do a lot of guided injections and I've got like guided procedures uh, using x-ray or a fluoroscope for guidance as well as ultrasound. So two different types of modalities, two different things that you'd be looking at. Um, But it's really kind of a specialty of image guided procedures, a lot to do with injection. So if you're doing, you know, say a hip injection, you need to use guidance. If you're doing more complex injections, you might be around an artery or a nerve. So you got to watch the needle path. Same idea. You want to use image guidance. So a lot of the procedures I do is using that to accomplish whatever the goal for that procedure is. Also diagnostically, getting back to the ultrasound. Uh, yeah, patient comes in and has calf pain or shoulder pain. I can put down the ultrasound and do a quick scan of the soft tissue and see, oh, yep, uh, you know, you tore your gastroc, but your Achilles looks good, or your rotator cuff is intact, you just have some bursitis. You know, that's an, another just diagnostic tool. So procedure-wise, I, I can do that. I was actually just today even doing diagnostic ultrasound for carpal tunnel. So that's, you know, it's being used more and more. So procedure-wise, I definitely do a number of different things. And for the fluoroscopic guided things, I, I do spinal injections. Um, so people about hep, epidurals, but we do radiofrequency ablation and other types of injections and things to the spine as well. A little bit of everything. So that's awesome. Let's jump in kind of launching off of that discussion Mm -hmm. of of image guided procedures. Let's let's jump into your little presentation here and chat about this. Let's go back to the beginning. Should we go back to the beginning? Yeah, let's go back. How to go back to the beginning quickly. Uh, Let's see. 
I'll just go over here. <laughs> so, <there it> is. <laughs> All right, so, so this is a just part of a brief talk that I've given in the past. And this is just giving a quick idea of you know some of the things related to ultrasound specifically is that we're going to do our talk here. So uh, the, you know, there's many different types of you know things that we're going to do. Uh, most many are done with X-ray or ultrasound for guidance. And again, that has to do with uh, what you're trying to target. X-ray can be helpful and better for some situations, and ultrasound for others. Uh, spinal injections, uh, really, X-ray is gold standard. Um, this is an example of a joint injection. So. A joint. Uh, this is an arthrogram. So this is classically how, say, a shoulder joint injection was done, done under x-ray, and basically just using this to visualize the needle. And then you can also see the contrast dye filling up the joint there. This is becoming, this is done less and less now for most orthopedic injections. You know, although the x-ray is good at visualizing the bone, you don't really see the soft tissue around it very well. Um, so if you're trying to avoid other structures, it's not really good. And also, there's always a consideration when you're using x-ray is that there's radiation. So whether it's you as the physician, your staff, patient, you know, you know, I may be doing, you know, young kids, things like that. So x-ray for most orthopedic problems is being used less and less, but still it's being used uh, for you know, you have to use it in the spine. So when we're using ultrasound, again, I'm really able to visualize soft tissue well, and there's a few advantages. Again, there's no radiation, um, and there may be other complicating factors. I see a lot of post-operative patients, and there can be artifact and, and issues from either surgical wounds and um, sutures, metal prosthesis. So the ultrasound is a really good way to bypass all that. The hard part is that it's very user dependent. So it's not, it, it's easily learned, but there's a steep learning curve. You don't know much until then all of a sudden you know everything and it's actually quick, um, but you definitely need to just get kind of, you know, get, get your hands dirty here. So the main idea for any kind of image guided procedure is really two, it comes down to two things. Accuracy, you want to make sure you're targeting the right spots and safety. Again, there may be nerves or arteries or other structures. That's very important that you don't injure them. Um, so it's really helpful. Um, and again, ultrasound is becoming more of the gold standard um, because it's easy, it's cheap, and um, it, you know there's no harm to the patient using it. You know, this would be an example of just an injection around the wrist. Again, this is the basic setup. In one hand, you're using the ultrasound probe. So in this example, the the uh, our you know my, this is my hands, but the the left hand is holding the ultrasound probe. Um, so you're lining things up, and actually my eyes are on the ultrasound screen. So once I get my hands in position, I'm no longer looking at my hands. I'm looking at the ultrasound screen. In my right hand, I I have the needle and I'll be advancing based on what I'm seeing on the screen. And you know, it just depends on the body part and hand position. So this would be around the shoulder. Again, just another example of positioning an ultrasound probe and the needle path. So this is what it looks like if you're looking at it from the outside. And here's some examples of the screen of what I'm actually looking at. So again, the top left corner, you can see again, hand position and needle position. And these are just uh, two examples on the screen, what I would be looking at. So if you look at the bottom left screen, that, that kind of goes over the anatomy and we can kind of see what we're talking about. And you can see how there's different densities. We call it the echogenicity of the tissue. So certain tissue that's labeled, say, the deltoid looks a certain way. So that has a lot of water content, so it looks darker. In other structures, such as bone, it looks very bright. So here, this is basically a labeled uh, a screenshot of what the ultrasound looks like. So the target on an injection like this is that kind of orange, yellow oval there. That's a tendon. And that's really what, uh, for this injection, that's where we want the needle to end up. You can see that very, hopefully you can see that small little red dot. That's actually a little artery there. So that's an example of a structure that obviously you want to try to avoid. So that's something that I can actually see on the ultrasound and, you know, and make sure that everything's going where it needs to go and not where we don't want it. And and basically it, it turns in from that kind of, the orange oval structure. And then I can watch as um, the, the videos aren't, aren't gonna work here, but um, the as I put in the fluid, again, fluid is dark. 
So what I'm able to see afterwards is the fluid flowing where it needs to. So this is the tendon sheath. And you can see the biceps tendon is labeled BT and the dark area is the fluid around that tendon sheath. So it allows me to just watch the medicine flows flow where it needs to go. And this is just an example of alternative approaches. So I can get to that same spot five different ways. And that, that's again, the advantage of the ultrasound. Not every person is the same. So sometimes I need to change my approach. So being able to see their anatomy in real time with the ultrasound is, is, is you know, crucial. Ultrasound is really going to be, uh, you know, a big part of the future with medicine. I think in most specialties, more and more specialties are going to get comfortable with it because it's, it's such a great tool. And I think even in, in medical school, you know, uh, I actually don't know this. And Ryan, you, maybe you would know. I don't know if they're doing more with integrating yeah. ultrasound in curriculum. Yeah. They are. They yeah. are. Okay. Yeah, they definitely are. I've, I've seen lots of uh, lots of students on Instagram and stuff. The the med student influencers talking about their mm. um, their ultrasound kind of curriculum and okay. it's definitely not stuff that we had in medical school. Yeah, definitely not. And you know, we kind of learned the hard way, but you know, it's it's going to be crucial. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, you know, for anybody getting into medical school, because um, many fields are going to utilize this. What do you um, think about? Um, the the butterfly uh ultrasounds the those are like for some privileged students out here watching they they could get that for like christmas and just start playing with it is that is that something you think is is useful um good question i i <laughs> i don't know we we probably do a study on that and publish that and see if it it improves you know the, the you know the that um uh, learning curve into it yeah. this i do think it would be you know all things being equal the sooner you can get your hands on things and the sooner you can, uh, you know, look at anatomy and just visualize tissue, it, it just becomes second nature. It all makes sense. And it, it's, it, I'll tell patients sometimes to look at the screen because they're like, well, what, what's this doctor looking at? And I'm like, well, all right, this is what I'm looking at. I'll show them. And they tell me they have no idea what they're looking at. Well, just like, I mean, maybe we're dating ourselves. You remember those pictures where it was like a graphic picture you couldn't visualize the 3D picture and look. Oh, you magic kind of eyes, dude! Magic yeah. eyes. It's amazing. So, I love magic eyes. Yeah. So, so, so you, you you don't really see the picture until you get it and you know yeah. how to look for it, and then yeah. you can pop them up. So this is kind of the same idea Great with analogy. ultrasound. So you can you it just looks like a blot. Yeah, you, you don't know what the heck's going on. But if you do it enough, all of a sudden everything just makes sense. So even yeah. now, if you show me like a liver ultrasound, which I never do you know, another, a radiologist could quickly orient me and I would know kind of what we're looking at there. So, um, so yeah, the, the sooner you get your hands on things, uh, yeah, it's just gonna help you, uh, you know, just, I, I think it's gonna help a lot. Yeah. So I, yeah, if that's an option for people. Great. <laughs> if if um, mommy and daddy are pretty well off, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's only a couple grand. It. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, Sure. Um, so yeah, no, good, good tool. And, and definitely, yeah, I, I guess to your point, yeah, going to be used more and more here. Um, but yeah, and, and, you know, just, just, I guess with regard to injections. Yeah, this is a, just, there's a lot of studies and I helped kind of author a, a book and basically went through a lot of different areas. So, you know, there's, there's some injections where it's more accurate if you do it. So there's studies to show use ultrasound, it works well. If you don't use ultrasound, you know, you, you miss a lot. So for example, the injection I just showed you, all right, you're getting close to 90% of the time, you're getting perfect placement of the medication. If you don't use the ultrasound, about three quarters of the time, you're going to completely miss or it's not going to get into the right spot. So definitely yeah. a lot of advantages and there's a lot of you know, studies to, to show that. Yeah. You, you know, it's interesting reading, reading that study there, some of the data from that study, uh, and then kind of uh, comparing that to the current pandemic we're in and mm -hmm. the vaccine reactions that we're seeing, there's some hypothesis that um, improper placement of the vaccine potentially in a vein or an artery is causing these more severe vaccine reactions. And it's like, well, yeah. maybe we should give all vaccines under some ultra, uh, ultrasound guidance. Yeah. The, the Yeah. So from my standpoint, I think that would be an option, but it wouldn't necessarily be because there's not enough people who know how to use them properly. Slows everything down. 
Yeah, um, I think making sure you, when you do an injection, you can try drawing back. And sometimes if you're in a vessel, you actually see a little flashback of blood and you should just adjust. Um, but, you know, we're seeing, we're, we're definitely even seeing patients, especially thinner patients. I think sometimes when they're injecting, they're going into some structures instead of just the muscle of the deltoid, yeah. they're getting into the rotator cuff and other things. So we've definitely, we've seen some kind of trauma. So it, it's hard when you're trying to vaccinate, you know, hundreds of millions of people, sometimes stuff's just going to go wrong. Yep. Um, hard, hard, hard to avoid, but, um, yeah, it's, it's thoughts like that, that we're always trying to better. All right. You know, can we make this better? Can we make it more accurate? Can we make less side effects or make it tolerated better? And those are the questions that we're asking everything that we're doing. And is there an easy, cheap, effective, reproducible way to make treatment more effective for patients? And that's really what it comes down to, whether it's vaccine or anything else that we're mentioning here, you know, we're trying to optimize those outcomes. I'm waiting for a camera small enough to be put on the tip of a, uh, of a needle so that we can just go in and see where we're at. Hey, that's, that's the billion yeah, dollar you, idea right there. That's the billion dollar <laughs> idea. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a couple of, I mean, a couple of these are, are videos that aren't really working, but um, I mean, th that's the general, that's the general idea. You guys get the idea and, you know, we're going through all different structures. This would be a live Doppler again, showing blood vessels. So, so again, these are just some of the things that I'm looking at and I can see. Um, and this is what I really use to help optimize patient outcomes. So I have a lot of, um, uh, you know, colleagues, you know, the orthopedic surgeons, whether it's hand, wrist, foot, you know, whatever, you know, sending me different procedures just because we know the outcome is going to be better, um, you know, with, with using that for guidance. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can uh, share my screen to see this one procedure. Let's see. Make it All right, so, Let's see. so real quick, you're going to look at the um, kind of halfway through the left side of the screen. You, there's a, uh, a dark oval. Yep, right there. And that tip right there, right next to the mouse, that's actually the needle tip. So that's a cyst. So a ganglion cyst is just a collection of fluid. So think about it just like a water balloon. So that water balloon is sitting in the wrist. Just below it is bone. Just above it with parallel lines going left and right, that's a tendon. And then the skin is on top. So I used the ultrasound and I was able to guide the needle, avoid all those other structures. And then the tip is just in the cyst now. And what you're going to see is you're going to see the fluid basically disappear as you as you back yep so um so number one I, you avoid all the stuff you don't want to hit and then i can make sure that i'm in the cyst you, you have to thing, do it with the sound effect there you go. <laughs> uh you know so we, we can see that all right we're collecting the fluid sometimes cysts can be what's called complex meaning they have multiple compartments to them so sometimes i'll start to aspirate and i get everything except i see another area adjacent to it still has fluid so I just redirect the needle over to that area, and you can just be insure, you can be assured that you're fully um, aspirating everything. So again, that's that real time visual of what I'm looking at as I do it. So yeah, that's just you know one of the, one of the things that I do. Nice, that's super yeah. satisfying. And, and how often does a patient get like? pretty immediate like oh my gosh I oh felt with that. something like, with something like that it's immediate so anytime you you're anytime they're having pain from uh a collection of fluid or uh, something like that sometimes it's in their knee or that was around their wrist uh they, they they walk out feeling immediately better so um is this another video okay yeah yeah so so that's pretty pretty immediate so here's an example of just watching the fluid flow into the joint. So, you, so that's the ankle joint um, and that you can't see the needle, but sometimes you don't always need to. I guide the needle into the joint and I start to put in the fluid. I go to a different part of the joint just to make sure that it's completely filling it properly. So again, it's just another way that even if you're in the right spot, sometimes it doesn't mean that things are going well. So you want to ensure that you're you're targeting the correct area so i can watch the distension of the joint capsule and ensure that the medicine's flowing where it needs to nice yeah
and also satisfying when you when you think you know what you're doing and then you have the pictures to prove that you know what you're doing so that's that's kind of nice does how much potentially um just just knowing the um kind of psychology of this how much do you think this helps the patient get better because they Huge. can see go oh i see what you just did therefore i should yeah. get better because of that yeah I, I guess it was a different talk that I didn't include it on this. Um, there's actually the placebo effect is huge in medicine. And I am fascinated you know, by this. They've done studies to look at pills. A larger pill has a better therapeutic value than a smaller pill. Yep. Um, and they've done direct studies to look at uh, injections and using the ultrasound, all things being equal, gives patients better satisfaction and better results. Um, you know, part of that can be attributed to, you know, basically how it's done, but they've also, um, you know, taken, you know, some of the factors in and they've been able to extrapolate a placebo effect from it as well. Nice. So, so it, again, it, you know, it's, it's helpful. Uh, patient satisfaction has also been looked at. So everything is patient satisfaction these days for better or for worse. I won't get into that, but, uh, but there's more patient satisfaction. Uh, there's a better effect. There is a placebo effect. So it's one of those things. It's a harmless placebo effect because there's no radiation. Mm. So we just you, use that to your advantage. Why, why not? We want to do it anyways. Um, it, you know, so if, if the patient feels better because of it, great. I, I'm, I'm all, all about it. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, for all of you watching, uh, if you want to come on and ask some questions, go ahead and raise your hand. I just cleared out the queue. So uh, make sure we get people who want to come on and ask some questions. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, Grace asked a good question. How do you deal with those who have some needle phobias? Mm. Every day. That's <laughs> a part of what I do. Uh, yeah, that, that's tough. Uh, I, I think that every doctor is going to handle it probably a little bit different. Um, what I try to do is, uh, you know, a couple of things. One it's all about trying to make the patient comfortable. And number two, try to make them very rapidly understand that I'm competent. So if I come in in a confident, understanding manner, and I'm explaining to them what's going on and what's going to occur in very plain language so they can understand what I'm saying, they're going to have the confidence that I know what the heck I'm doing. If I go in and I'm fumbling around, or if I don't really talk to them, they're going to have no idea who the heck I am. You know, so I'm coming in and doing these different procedures and never have met them before. So, and that's just something a part of medicine. I mean, how are you going to be comfortable going in and just talking to a patient? I, I still remember, I don't know if you remember, uh, you know, some of the mock history and physicals when you're just in medical school, going in and just talking to a patient, taking a history. Um, you know, part of that is, all right, starting to understand medicine. And then two, it's just, it's repetition. You know, you got to be comfortable knowing what you're talking about, asking the right questions. So when I go into the patient, I already know what I'm going to do. I'm going to know the approach. I know how things are going to go. So from the medical standpoint, that's the easy part. So it's just, it's, I guess it's just my affect and how I try to present myself to the patient in a calm, understanding, non-rushed manner and that and you just go from there so most patients do fine some patients you just got to recognize that they're just they're just freaking out and sometimes you just got to go you're just like all right just lay down just talking is not gonna um, help so you just kind of go for it um, so it's just being in practice for now you know seven and a half years and doing thousands and thousands of these I'd, I'd say almost every single day there's at least one patient who is very scared and I can see it on their face within five seconds of walking in. So it's just, you know, another skill that you develop as a physician, just like anything else. Yeah. I I would just knowing me, I would use humor and, and have mm -hmm. like a, a joke needle that was like a one gauge, which doesn't exist. Yeah. Like, no. okay, here, we're going to get ready to aspirate your knee. Yeah. You're like, no, 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 uh, just kidding. Yeah. It's this one. Yeah. And, and so it's yeah. that's the expectation. Like, oh, at yeah. least it's not the big one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, let's bring okay. some people on here. Uh, we'll bring Tressie on and let's see some of the great questions. 
Um, what, what's the age mix that you typically see as a kind of a sports med uh, physiatrist? Um, I, I'd say in general, most, uh, still most patients, even, even though you're doing like sports medicine, even orthopedic surgeons, unless they're super sub specialized in a large academic center, most everybody's still seeing a wide range of patients, mostly middle-aged, you know, we'll say like on average 40 to 50, because that's when a lot of things happen. Uh, it's when, it's you know, when the I, body I, starts breaking down, I want to break down, man. <laughs> you know, you, you, you will see, you know, I, I still see, I, I'll see teenagers, um, you know, especially a lot for overuse injuries, stress fractures and this, that, and the other. And I've seen patients over a hundred. Um, so you really see the wide gamut because if somebody has knee pain, uh, again, the, the differential diagnosis or, you know, what could be going on may be different in the 16 year old football player versus 90 year old grandpa, but, but still a lot of it's very similar. So it's not completely dis, you know, dissimilar. So I'll see some very specific sports related injuries, but still a lot of it is just different body parts hurt as well. Yeah. Makes sense. Tressie, say hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So I, um, I really like this physiatry um, and I think I've like never found it before and I feel like I yep. need it for myself. Um, so my first question is like, how much does the public know about this specialty and yeah. how many people do you think like need it that don't know about it? Yeah, so there are many people in the public that are not familiar with the specialty. Um, it's relatively small, probably compared to most other specialties, and especially with what I'm doing and what most physiatrists are doing now with outpatient musculoskeletal care, that is relatively new within that field in general. There's still parts of the field that do other types of rehabilitation work with patients post-stroke or post-traumatic brain injury, post-spinal cord injury, amputation. So there's other parts of the field that are much older. Um, so what we're doing in the musculoskeletal world is definitely newer. And because it's a smaller field, a lot of people haven't heard of it. And even patients that a lot of times will come to see me haven't necessarily heard of it or are not that familiar with it. So you just kind of, you know, quickly educate them. But really, it, it I think it integrates quite seamlessly to, um, you know, other, um, I should say other medical groups. So I'm a part of a group that has orthopedic surgeons, mm -hmm. neurosurgeons, rheumatology, and physiatry. There's other large centers people may have heard in the East Coast out of uh, New York. There's Hospital for Special Surgery, which is a large um, orthopedic hospital that is kind of have the same thing. So there's other larger centers and physiatry seamlessly integrates into these because you know really we have a different view every specialty has a different view on a patient and some patients all right it's pretty straightforward but we definitely work pretty hand in hand with some patients that may be more complex you know is their back causing the problem or is it the hip the neurosurgeon says one thing the orthopedic surgeon for the hip says another and a lot of times it, the physiatry is, you know, the physiatrist is going to be the person to actually help to make the diagnosis. So every day I'm seeing patients with my colleagues and you're working with them to actually kind of find the diagnosis. So our viewpoint um, is unique and helps to integrate a lot of the different fields. So I think really it's an underutilized, obviously I'm biased saying this, it's an underutilized specialty. Um, because it can be used a number of different ways. I mean, as primary care musculoskeletal medicine, you know, if you, you know, hurt something, you don't always necessarily need a super subspecialized orthopedic surgeon to handle that. And in fact, you know, I, I can hear all the time, you know, the, the surgeons dealing with non-surgical cases or things that they shouldn't necessarily be dealing with because it's not very complex. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that I think will continue to grow. And really in the healthcare field, you know, it should continue to grow. There are actually medical studies to show, um, it was out of Michigan, um, an insurance company was looking at all their outcomes for, uh, you know, for spine issues. Long story short, patient, patients that had a physiatrist in their care, basically at any point, overall did better. And from the insurance standpoint, their care costs less money. So they're looking at a couple of data points. So there's even studies to look at physiatrists 
in, integration of physiatry care can be beneficial to many, many patients. So it, I hope it continues to grow. Yeah, I have a, just one more question, if that's okay, kind of spinning yeah. off of that. Um, so orthopedic surgeons, they're like super motivated and like very hardcore and uh, mm -hmm. very competitive. And mm -hmm. is physiatry similar to that? I'm kind of thinking maybe not since it's newer, which personally, like that would be great for me because I don't want to have to deal with people <laughs> being so. Yeah. So, so good. <laughs> yeah. Good question. I mean, and, and there's always the perception of, all right, you know, what kind of person do you need to be to get into different fields? Right. I mean, I, I know some of the most laid back neurosurgeons in the world and I know uptight physiatrists, so it can definitely vary. And even within the uh, programs, sometimes programs can vary. I, I agree in general, uh, like, you know, like an orthopedic surgery program, you know, everything may seem more intense. Um, I think that's becoming overall less less of an issue. There's less less of a discrepancy between the two. Um, but I mean, if uh, it's really the specialty that needs you need to pick the specialty, what you like, what's the, the subject matter, and you know, some of that other stuff will fall into in, into place. I think there's so many safeguards with regards to how programs are run where you're not going to have too much of an issue with you know whether it's work or the environment you know how many hours things like that and even but the the fellowship and residency i did i was, I was at mount sinai in in new york i mean i wouldn't say it was exactly easy i mean my internship was pretty intense like residency my fellowship i worked a lot um so, it, you know, I think the culture was very good. And that's one of the reasons why I chose that program. Um, so it's definitely something to be mindful of. Um, and maybe that's the general trend, ortho more intense than physiatry or more in your face. But I think that's, you know, not as much of an issue as people actually think. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's, that's sure. really helpful. Good. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, <clears throat> nobody wants to come on and talk today. Usually if there's a huge li list, so you, nobody wants to talk to you. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll pick, I'll pick better guests next time. Sorry, we should, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You want to talk? Uh, so what are you doing? No. Um, let's talk politics. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm looking, there's some really good questions here. So we'll, we'll find some questions here. Yeah. One of my favorite questions always is, um, uh, turf wars, like mm -hmm. uh, for maybe physiatrists who aren't in a, a well-structured group like you are, mm -hmm. where kind of the, the people booking the appointments know where to send everyone. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like there's a lot of potential overlap between physiatry and orthopedics for mm -hmm. the procedures that you're doing and everything else. Yeah. How, how do you how do you do that turf war thing in a hospital setting or, or out in the community where there may, be, may not be a big group like yourself? Oh, boy. Um, I think it's going to be more challenging to address that even in a hospital system because it's so big, it's hard to change. In my group, there's, you know, we'll say changes, but I think about 30 doctors. Um, so number one is getting into a group where you know your skills are needed. So when I interview, I'm looking for a place, number one, that I know I like the other doctors and the other doctors will be good to work with um, because ultimately, you know, good care inevitably involves multiple specialties. So if I value the other doctors and they're good physicians, they're good and communicative with me, I know that I bring value to the table so that they're going to want to incorporate me into their patient's care. So I think the biggest thing is just, you know, talking to the other docs and making sure you fit in with that specific group. Because if other people know what you do or how you can be benefit their group, nobody's going to want to share patients with you. So it's just becoming, you know, a good colleague with your other physicians. Then there's the administrative staff where literally when I first start, I met with the phone room multiple times and all the administrative staff saying, all right, this is what I do. These are the patients I want to see. These are the patients I don't want to see. You, you know, you need to go, you be specific. If you don't tell anybody, I, I mean, how's anybody going, going to know? But I'd say the number one thing is just being very 
open with communication with the other physicians that you work most closely with. And that is crucial. Even with primary care doctors in the community, um, they need to know who to send their patients to. So if they know what I do and how I can help their patients, they're going to involve me in their care. Yeah. Makes sense. Cool. Um, David, unmute yourself. Ask a question. Hey there. Can you hear me? Yep. Sweet. All right. Um, so I'm sure you probably get this a lot, um, but I was wondering um, what specifically made you uh, decide um, I would like to become a physician? A physician? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> Med school interview. Quickly, med school. Why yeah. do you want to be a doctor? Uh, <laughs> uh, man, I was like, I don't know. I want to help people. No. Um, <laughs> I like science and I want to help people, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, so, so, all right. So medicine was in my family. So I, it, I was never pressured into anything. My parents didn't care what I did. Um, I am actually the fifth generation physician in my, in my family. Um, so it sounds like I was destined to do it, but I really wasn't. <laughs> uh, I, I really, yes, I did like sciences and everything. I was an athlete growing up a um, long, long time ago. So, you know, I played hockey, college lacrosse, golf. I played football. So I did a lot of sports. So I've always been interested in the, in the body, um, learning about it. How do I get better? Nutrition, um, all that. So that was a personal mission of mine to just, you know, I was just curious. So I just ate up that information growing up. I just loved it. So I always knew I was interested in the, in the body and how things worked. Uh, and you know, with your own sports injuries, you know, you learn how to treat things and, uh, you know, you just kind of gain knowledge over time, but I'd say just learning about the anatomy and physiology to apply to the sports that I played was the biggest draw into, you know, what, what I do now. Uh, I didn't decide to, you know, apply to medical school until after my sophomore year of college, meaning freshman, sophomore year, I still wasn't sure. Uh, what I wanted to do, if I was going to go into teaching or, you know, I was always interested in high school, like teacher, things like that. I didn't decide to formally push forward to go pre-med until junior year of college. Uh, and that was really just, I, I, I just, at that point, just, just knew I wanted to be a, be a doctor. Um, it's hard to project out, you know, when you're 20, what you want to be like as a person when you're 30. So it's always hard um, but I, I just went with the decision of what interests me. What do I want to learn more about? What do I want to, um, you know, basically, you know, have my life completely immersed in? And the human body was that answer. So that's that made that decision for me. Awesome. Yeah. I just um, I've just always wondered about that question myself, and um, I very rarely actually hear the the reasons for why um, current yeah. doctors are um, yeah. like have yeah. gone into that field. But um, yeah, I, I appreciate the answer. Yeah. 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 And again, I think it's even like picking a specialty in your heart of heart. You kind of know, you know, you know what you're really interested in. If you're hearing five different lectures, if you're listening to me talk versus Ryan versus some other person that comes on this, sometimes some things are going to resonate with you and you're just going to know. So there's certain subject matter that's going to grab you, whether it's deciding to go to medical school or something else, or if you're in medical school, a specific specialty. So you just have to be honest with yourself and just realize what is drawing you in. And you just got to go with that because if, if it's not drawing you in, it's a lot of work. So it's going to feel like a lot of work if you're not really devoted in, into it. It's just going to be, it's going to be more of a hassle. But if you enjoy it, it makes it actually very rewarding. So you just have to know really where your interests lie and what's what's sucking you in and go with that. All right. I will keep that in mind going forward. I appreciate yeah. it. Awesome. Sure. Thanks, David. All right. Natalia. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm curious to know Hi. a little bit more about your day-to-day. What does your patient um, load look like? And I think you were talking about this when I got pulled in from the mic test. Um, so if you already addressed it, I'll catch the replay. But how often do you interact with primary care doctors? And then what other specialties do you interact with, um, if any? Yeah. So so the way I 
ch- kind of chose my job is I was, because my wife's also a doctor, she's dealing with a call schedule and all that. So uh, one of the things I wanted to do is make sure I don't have to do any more call and other things. So that was one thing. So my day to day is I go to work Monday through Friday and that's it. Uh, I'm generally in the office by about, you know, no later than 730. Um, just getting things prepped for the day, uh, see patients till about five, um, and then just finish up whatever I, I need to. Um, there can be some variability in that, obviously, but I'm just doing all outpatient care. Uh, you know, busy days may see 30 people, uh, lighter days, 20 people. Uh, I'd say on an average day, you know, at least two thirds of that is, um, you know, half to two thirds, depending on the day is just general office visits. So either new consultations or follow-up visits. Uh, There's certain, uh, you know, twice a week I'm doing EMGs, so the nerve conduction studies. So a couple hours, Mondays and Wednesdays. Each day I'm doing some types of injections. So I'll have blocks of ultrasound injections or aspirations or diagnostic ultrasounds. And that'll fill up anywhere between two to three hours each day. Fridays I'm doing a lot of spinal procedures. So that's mostly just basically eight to five of different types of spine interventions and injections, th- things like that. So that's kind of just day to day, mostly what, what I'm doing, just hands on. So a little bit of a, a mix there. Most of my interaction with other physicians is mostly within our group, just the way things are set up. So talking to neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons and also other physiatrists. So just consulting and being like, hey, I, I don't know what's going on. Come help me out or, or take a look at this picture. I, I'd say... of my interaction with the other doctors in our group is like, come look at this. Like, you know, you gotta, you know, can you tell me what this is? Or, you know, I think it's this, what do you think? Um, So just kind of quick curbside uh, running something past each other, Uh, you know, so, and that it's again working with physiatrists and ortho and neurosurgery. As far as primary care, uh, when I first, uh, you know, got into our group, I made an effort to go out into the community and just meet different primary cares and say, hey, you know, if you need something, just let me know. This is what I do. And I don't often directly interact with primary cares unless it's a a patient who is more complex and needs some additional specifics. Usually they'll just show up on my doorstep and say, hey, Dr. Such and Such sent me to see you. And then I have to figure out what the heck's going on. I'll send my note. So usually I'm it's pretty clear. You can read the other doctor's note and just I'm just telling them what they need to know. Um, but, you know, I'd say like a couple times a month, I am on the phone with the primary care, just going over into more detail uh, what what we need to. So and and I have a few primary cares that will text me or call me saying, hey, I have this patient. Do you think I should have them see you or somebody else? So, again, it's just all about being, uh, you know, being available and being you know willing to talk to your colleagues or primary cares or any other other doctors. Um, but yeah, it's mostly within my, my group because we, we, de- we deal a lot with, you know, complex cases. So you, a lot of times more than one person's in, uh, you know, involved, which was crucial to choosing this group because I, I, I knew some of the docs and I knew how well they were trained and things like that. Uh, and that's made a world of difference. That's really the best part of my job is the other doctors I work with and being able to communicate with them on a daily basis. Um, I, I don't know what I would do if I, you know, if I didn't have that, that is, that's crucial and huge and it's been great for me. Yeah. Does that Thank answer you. your questions? Yeah, no, that's really yeah. helpful. Um, yeah. that made me think of one quick follow-up question. Mm-hmm. So when I hear you describe that, it sounds like you're probably seeing new patients, but not really building the long-term relationship because mm-hmm. hopefully they wouldn't come back to you. Is that true? Yep. Or do you have um, patients oh, the, the, that come in? Yeah, the, 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 everybody's gonna have their, their repeats. I, you know, There's definitely a large population that you may see as a new consultation, sometimes just once. There may be times where you see them and there's a, you know, whether it's one, two, three, ten 10 follow-ups, but eventually they just are better or stable. But there's always some patients that you know there's going to be a chronic issue that's not necessarily going to resolve itself and that you're going to be basically following them, you know, basically moving forward. Uh, and, you, you know, you you see their name on the schedule and you're like, okay, I, I know Barbara's coming back in. All right, let's see how Barb's doing today, you know. And, you know, so you definitely make relationships. I think the other thing about uh, about that too is, 
you may treat one family member. And again, if you're in a community or even maybe at a larger center, it, it, again, if you just, you know, are a normal person and, you know, you're, you're doing, you know, well by the patients, a lot of times you end up seeing grandma and the grandson and sometimes they come in as a family and, you know, I've gotten to know a lot of families over time too. So there's definitely some continuity uh, with, with uh, you know, patients and families uh, from that standpoint. So it's not all just one and done, although mm-hmm. many times that might be the goal with a new injury, but there's certain chronic conditions that you know are just going to be, all right, we're gonna manage this, we're gonna work together, we're gonna try to optimize how you're doing. There's no fix for this, or they may not be a candidate for a fix. So you're going to follow them for for quite a while. Yeah. So. Thanks, Thank Natalia. you so much. Yeah. Yep. All right. Last but not least, Rhythm. Hello. Unmute yourself. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Saylor and Dr. Yeah. Gray. Yeah. Um, my question was like, you said that physiatry um, is like you did a sports medicine fellowship. And so I was just wondering mm-hmm. like how easy it is to switch between like physiatry and sports medicine. Uh, you mean in practice on a yeah. daily basis or, okay. So, uh, so sports medicine can mean a lot of different things. Uh, so I'm board certified with physiatry, but then I also have a board certification in sports medicine. Now orthopedic surgeons could also be sports medicine physicians. Um, so it can mean different things in different areas. Um, basically, from my ed- from the educational standpoint, um, through fellowship, you're dealing a lot with acute athlete injuries. You know whether they're injured on the field. So I'm at the games or I'm at the sites as the primary responder. So you need to know how to triage that. Um, so you, you definitely get a lot of acute injuries, and then also in the office, how to manage those specific sport specific injuries knowing return to play protocols and things like that. There, there's just so much overlap with what I do on a daily basis between the two. It basically just blurs together. Um, you know, you may have a, a patient who's 50 who also has a knee problem, just like your 16 year old that has a knee problem. And they may both be doing okay. You need to know when to get them to do more exercise, what kinds of exercise, why certain exercises are okay for them to add in when. So there's a lot of, there, there's just so much overlap where it essentially blends, blends together. The only real distinction is if you are ever at a physical sports game, like at a, at a game, football game, hockey, whatever it is, um, there's maybe a few additional considerations that you have, um, you know, just making sure you know where, you know, what's the ambulance, where's the hospital, AED, you know, there's a few other considerations, but in the office, it, it's essentially no different. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Good question, Rhythm. Dr. Christopher Saylor, our time has come to a close. For those of you okay. watching, we did not disclose. Chris and I went to med school together. Uh, mm. So we, we've we known each other for, for quite a few years now. Um, many, many years. Many years. Many, yeah. many, many. <laughs> Many, many, many um, some, yeah. some good times, some good times together. Yeah. So, um, thank you for coming on. I, I sent a text to your wife with a screenshot of us chatting. I, I, oh, yeah? I, I told her, thank you for letting me borrow you for a little bit of time. Okay. Um, so th- thanks for all Appreciate that. Go give her a big hug. And, I will. Uh, hopefully everyone learned a little bit of something about, uh, some I hope so. physiatry or as we like to call it, uh, physiatry here today. Yeah. Yep. Hope everybody enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. Bye.